Team. On Overdrive today, we check out Lexus's significant steer-by-wire technology, pit Royal Enfield's popular 350cc motorcycles against the Triumph Speed 400, and check out the Vision Mercedes Maybach 6 Coupe concept. Hello and welcome to Overdrive, I am Soini Dutt. Just recently, Rohit was flown into Japan not only to drive some of the most exclusive Lexus cars in Japan, but he also got a chance to test a breakthrough steer-by-wire technology. Now, it is time for us to find out just how this innovative technology will reshape the way we drive in the future. So, I'm at the Fuji Speedway on invitation by Lexus to drive a Lexus that has a steering wheel that looks like a Formula 1 steering wheel. But this is not a Formula 1 steering wheel. This is steer by wire, a new technology that is being introduced with this, the new Lexus RZ. And this car is likely to come to India. So I'm going to tell you a lot about the car. But first, I'm going to drive and see how steer by wire feels compared to the usual steering systems that we've experienced so far. Let's first talk about the RZ450e. It is the Lexus version of the Toyota BRZ, meaning it is a low-slung crossover that rivals the likes of the Mercedes-Benz GLB or EQB. It ups the ante over the Toyota sibling and blends the renowned luxury of the Lexus brand with eco-conscious innovation. Design-wise, it boasts of a sleek, aerodynamic profile with signature Lexus design elements like the bold spindle grille and the intricate LED lighting in the front and the rear. The interior is equally impressive, featuring high-quality materials, comfortable seating and a modern, tech-forward cabin. That said, the boot should have been bigger and the rear seating space could have been marginally better. Nevertheless, the RZ maintains a sophisticated and contemporary appearance both inside and out, typical to a Lexus. Under the hood, the RZ450e offers a potent electric powertrain featuring a 71 kilowatt hour battery pack, which promises a range of around 400 kilometers, which is short for today's times. But if you heard carefully, then you heard that right. This is the first all electric Lexus. No hybrid, fully electric. It has a battery of about 71 kilowatt hour capacity and you also get a dual motor setup with this. So acceleration is brisk, you get all wheel drive. You get a 150 kilowatt motor in the front, 80 kilowatt motor in the rear. But you know what's important? The car feels nice and light. It doesn't feel too heavy. This is running some really big batteries, but it doesn't feel heavy at all. I'm driving around some really, really tight sections right now. Let me show you that. And it just feels nice and light. It's so easy to maneuver. Now this one is running the standard electronic power steering. We are going to be sampling the other steer by wire. So apart from the shape, the first thing that you will notice when you get behind this wheel is that it feels very light because there is no shaft. There is absolutely no shaft. This steering is sending data to a computer and then the computer is doing the actual steering. How quick that is, is something that I'm going to find out on the track. But yeah, the first feeling is it just feels absolutely light. Uh, very much like the, uh, the computer or the PlayStation steering wheel systems that we have uh, for our racing simulations. It feels very much like that. So if you know that feeling, you will instantly feel this to be a very natural feeling steering in that sense. It's just the different shape, of course. And in terms of the layout and everything, I mean, it has its steering mounted controls. It has all the switch gear. So getting used to this is not going to be very difficult. But I'm really intrigued to find out how it actually performs out on the road. So let's waste no time. Let's take a look and see what this feels like. The first impression is that it feels ultra precise. Like I said, the feeling, the feedback is very much like a video game steering controller. 
There's no force feedback though, if you know what I mean, but I think even that will be engineered soon to add more feel to the steering system. You see, traditionally, cars use a mechanical steering linkage between the steering wheel and the front wheels that translates driver input into physical movement. However, this has limitations such as imprecise feedback, heavy steering, sometimes too light a steering, and vulnerability to road imperfections, something that we keep complaining about every now and then. Steer by wire, however, overcomes these issues by replacing the mechanical connections with electronic signals, much like a video game controller. It is very artificial. It will definitely need getting used to. Like a regular electronic power steering, here, the data is being fed to a computer. The computer is also reading your speed. It's also reading your accelerator position. It's also reading the angle of the vehicle. All these kind of data points are being read and accordingly, the steering angle is being decided. The system uses sensors and actuators to relay driver inputs to the wheels electronically, eliminating play, delay and slack in the steering mechanism. This results in a more immediate and accurate response, enhancing vehicle control and maneuverability. But it just takes the stress away completely. I mean, there are some really tight sections that we are driving on and compared to the standard EPS, this one just feels amazingly agile. Having gathered data for years now from traditional steering systems, the computers know exactly how much steering input is needed for which scenario. So it will potentially eliminate kickback on off-road driving or alter precision, weight and feel for enthusiastic driving, highway cruising, city commuting, etc. The steering is a lot more customizable in that sense, all in just one car. Some drivers may be initially hesitant about the technology's reliability and resilience, especially in extreme conditions. In the event of a malfunction, however, redundant systems ensure that the driver can maintain control of this vehicle, hence Lexus. Additionally, the technology facilitates the integration of advanced driver assistance systems, contributing to safer driving experiences. Steer by wire is a forward-looking technology then, that also aligns with the industry's shift towards autonomous driving. There is no torque steer, there is no kickback of any kind, there is no vague at center feeling, none of that. It's all gone. It's all going to be history when steering by wire takes over. So yeah, as a technology, sounds very promising. And even last minute corrections if you have to make any. It's all quick and in tight spaces, like I said, because it's reading multiple data points, it just also almost mimics the effects of a rear wheel steering. So even the turning radius and everything just feels so easy. Welcome to the future. In a nutshell then, steer by wire could redefine how a car feels in our hands while offering a driving experience that seamlessly combines precision, safety and comfort. Coming up on the other side, Triumph Speed 400 goes up against the Royal Enfield Classic and the Hunter 350. Welcome back here with us on Overdrive. Now, while it's not an apples to apples comparison, we have pit the Triumph Speed 400 against the Royal Enfield Classic as well as the Hunter 350. You might also be wondering why we haven't chosen to include the Harley Davidson X440 in this comparison. It's time to find out. A Tiger 400 would have been an instant hit and yet Triumph decided to go with modern retros as their first single cylinder motorcycle of modern times. And that's because in the premium entry level space, modern classics are where all the money is, which means that they have to go up against that brand, Royal Enfield. So why are we even comparing these motorcycles if they aren't exactly the same breed? Simply because the pricing of the Triumph and the Classic 350 is closely matched and the Hunter appeals to a similar audience who have a young bent of mind. Which one should you choose for street presence? All three do a great job at this. The Hunter 350 looks funky and youthful and even a non-RE rider wants to get a second glance and that explains its instant success. 
The Speed 400 goes with a racy styling too, but in a typical Triumph way. The colors, the stance, the attention to detail like the headlights and the taillights for example, it immediately makes it look and feel premium. So get this if you want that feel-good factor. The classic 350 is easily the best looking retro motorcycle in this space. And if old school is your vibe, simply stick to this tried and trusted nameplate. The Speed 400 may look like it's the smallest of the lot, but it's the most well put together. The fit and finish is top notch, the paint quality is really good. And looking at the Pulsar 250s and how they are aging, I think it will withstand the test of time. Let's hope so at least. Now there are a few bits here and there, like the exhaust for example, you can see that the header pipe or the collection chamber that is rusting a bit, uh, the logo is starting to lose its detailing. So all these tiny bits are there, but of course this is a prototype. And even if it wasn't, I think the powder coated engine will be far more enduring to our conditions compared to something like the classic 350 especially with all that chrome on it. The similar thing goes for the Hunter 350 as well. That black engine or the powder coated engine works for the Hunter as well. So overall, I quite like it. Which of these is more comfortable to ride? The suspension setup on the Hunter is a little on the stiffer side. Now the front is nice and supple, but the rear is especially pretty firm. With a pillion, with luggage, it works quite well. But if you're riding alone, you will feel the rear to be a bit jumpy. So in terms of the balance, the Classic actually does a better job. Once you get used to the weight of the motorcycle, you'll actually enjoy the way it goes around corners, the way it tackles bad roads. That balance is really good. But of course, the Tiger 400, that's the one that achieves the best balance when it comes to suspension. But the overall balance on this bike is something that I like. It's a testimony to the fact why this still remains one of the popular touring motorcycles in the country, even with the advent of so many adventure bikes. That's it. If you're planning to choose between the two Royal Enfields for primarily doing your urban duties and then also doing touring every now and then, this is the better touring motorcycle. That, in my books, is more of that easy-going urban runabout. Now, on the topic of touring, tyre choices. The Hunter is interestingly going to give you a wider option uh, to choose from because you have 17-inch rims both front and back, so you'll have a wider range of tyre options to choose from. This one goes with a 1918 setup, which works for its old-school styling, works with the handling as well, but in terms of the tyre choices, it is going to limit your options quite a bit. The saving grace, however, is that you can choose alloy wheels on this if you want, and that gives you the option to use tubeless tires. Now, if you are looking at a similar setup again, and now also introducing the Triumph in the mix, if you're going to be doing a lot of touring, in that case, the Speed 400, nice motorcycle, but for a lot of touring, I think I would want to wait for the Scrambler 400. With the longer suspension travel, with the more Scrambler intent, it is better equipped to take on our roads, which means the scope of touring is a lot wider than what either of these three motorcycles will offer you. Which is the best bike for mountain roads? The Toki engine in the Royal Enfields will allow you to scale some of the steepest mountain roads in the country, but in a laid-back manner. The Speed 400, on the other hand, will ensure that every bit of cornering and mountain riding experience is a rewarding one, and a sprightly one at that. The engine packs plenty of punch and the premium suspension shows its superiority with how much feel and confidence it offers. It's astonishing how many different kinds of engines we have now sampled in this particular segment. Java, Harley-Davidson, Hero, Honda even. And then this engine, you know, it's still so surprising that they actually managed to make an engine that feels more refined than even a Honda single. And that speaks volumes about what this engine feels like. It's got so much character that it's very difficult to choose, you know, any other engine over this particular engine. Even if it doesn't do the kind of speeds that the Speed 400 will do, there's still something very likable about this motor. And then things are going to get more confusing when you see the same motor in multiple bikes. You have these two, you also have the Meteor. Now, these two are the more relaxed positions, right? That's more of a cruiser, the Meteor. So if you have to choose between these two, it's finally going to boil down to the ergonomics. It's finally going to boil down to the weight. However, there's also a little bit of tuning difference between these two. I would side with that. How do they match up on fuel economy? Well, the Triumph coming so close on the economy figures, despite offering a sprightly performance, is commendable. Further savings could also be in the service department, where Triumph claims a 16,000 km service interval. The overall service costs, however, should be comparable to the Royal Enfields. A lot of spec sheet experts will tell you that there's a lot of common elements between the Dominar and the Speed 400. 
there aren't it's only the bore that is common between the two and that's only because it gave bajaj a good starting point or gave triumph a good starting point while designing this engine it's like a reference point think of it to be the grid on your camera app on your phone it just tells you what a good frame can look like where the subject can be placed and then you can start designing everything else around it that's exactly what the dominar did for uh, the speed 400 but honestly after riding this bike and that bike back to back you will feel that this is how the dominar should have been punchy comfortable and more importantly light the hathi mat palna advertising was more like me fat shaming another fat biker i mean that's just wrong this bike is also what the new generation of the pulsers should have been like 400 cc power just shy of a 390 duke a very nice and sculpted tank round headlight peppy performance easy to zip around town this just brings back memories of the og pulsar that's how good it is so thinking of this motorcycle to be a bajaj in triumph clothing is not a bad thing in fact the performance is so good and so close to bikes like the domina or the 390 duke that it makes the other modern retros start feeling as exciting as watching grass grow all these three motorcycles are full of emotion then but excel at different things and the choice will boil down to what kind of engine handling or styling resonates with you and in that sense the speed 400 despite being a good motorcycle won't really dent royal enfield all that much if anything it will simply expand the size of the market and that is win win for everyone the vision mercedes maybach 6 coupe concept is very popular around the globe and it comes to india for the very first time stay with us after this break to get a closer look at it Welcome back here with us on Overdrive. Mercedes-Benz India has been on an upswing. They have recorded 11% growth year on year as well as 22% growth in the premium top end model segment which houses the likes of the AMG models as well as the EQS. Now the German brand has collaborated with NMACC in Mumbai to offer all its customers some exclusive uh, experiences in terms of luxury, art and culture and one such futuristic concept on display at NMACC is the Vision Mercedes Maybach 6 coupe concept. Let's check it out. I'm here at the Neeta Mukesh Ambani Cultural Center and this is where Mercedes Benz has got an association with the Cultural Center. to well display cars such as this this is the vision 6 a maybach concept that was first showcased in 2016 at the montreal classic car week of course then the also showcased at pebble beach and effectively this car has gone across the world around the world showcasing a design language that mercedes was very well known for well back in the 60s and even before that for that matter The Maybach front grille reminiscent of the Maybach S-Class and GLS is gracefully exaggerated and perfectly complements the sleek LED headlights. The iconic three-pointed star adorns the hood just like the classic luxury cars from Mercedes-Benz. You look at it it's got the fantastic coupe lines, long sleek bonnet. By the way, that bonnet, well it just opens up. It's got a single hinge and it opens up on one side alone and uh, then of course you've got that coupe like roof line, you've got the greenhouse which is balance is right at the rear and fantastic uh, well scoops and detailing and musculature all across the vision 6 is aptly named for its staggering 6 meter length a striking chrome strip runs its entire length defining its distinct profile sleek cameras take their place aligning perfectly with the car's aerodynamic design gordon wagner described the design as reminiscent of a yacht evident in its graceful lines the rear is undeniably futuristic with a long brake light stretching to the mercedes benz logo the twin rear windshields offer a unique perspective too now coming to the heart of the matter performance oh wait you can't drive this car it is technically a battery operated remote control car that's operated with a wireless gamepad 
So this is what Mercedes Benz was very very famous for their coach work, their body work, well, renowned all across the world. We've seen several examples of this, and now you can see this too here at the Nita Mukesh Mani Cultural Center. This is not the only display, by the way. We've also got uh, the Peyton wagon or the motor wagon, which is going to be sitting at the art house in this cultural center. So come down to well NMACC. Of course, you can take a look at these two cars. And in case you are a Mercedes-Benz uh, owner, S-Class and above for that matter, you've got exclusive and well privileged benefits to enjoy right here at the theatre. For instance, you can get a well, you can get diamond box tickets, you can get fine, fantastic dining experiences. Mercedes-Benz is rolling on the red carpet for some of its top-tier customers across India. So enjoy this and a lot more. sustainability festival that Mercedes-Benz announced for October, they will be providing all of their customers with 50% road tax benefits and also all EV uh, customers will be able to charge their electric vehicles across the Mercedes-Benz network. With that, it's a wrap on this week's edition of Overdrive. But remember, you can stay in touch with the team through our social media channels and you can let us know what you think of our stories on YouTube. We'll see you next week. Until then, goodbye. Many thanks for watching.